Peace be with you. Friends, our second reading for this weekend is one of the most magnificent biblical reflections on faith. And you'll find it in the letter to the Hebrews. Faith, faith, faith is one of the most controverted subjects today. You probably know there are the new atheists who are a very uh, vocal presence on TV and the web and so on. And on a regular basis, basis, they excoriate faith and people of faith. In fact, on my website, I hear about this almost every day. How is faith characterized by the new atheists and their friends? Well, as credulity, superstition, accepting a lot of pre-scientific mumbo-jumbo, Bronze Age mythology, etc., etc. In other words, faith is characterized as something sub-rational and therefore unworthy of mature people. Christopher Hitchens, one of the uh, most prominent of the New Atheists, echoes Immanuel Kant, the Enlightenment philosopher, who said that people should dare to know. Don't settle for someone else's point of view, or accepting uh, strange stories from ancient times, you dare to know. So Hitchens says, time for people of faith to grow up, to let go of their childish preoccupations. If you want to see this on, on popular display, look at Bill Maher. Bill Maher, who is, I think, dramatically overexposed. You see him every place but is constantly bad-mouthing people of faith. And faith is just silly superstition. Well, can I offer this response first to the new atheists? Some of the great people of faith include St. Paul, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, St. Ignatius of Loyola, John Henry Newman, G.K. Chesterton, Blessed John Paul II. Now, say what you want about these people. But the one thing you cannot say about them is that they were unintelligent. See, right away, that should give the lie to those who say faith is simply a matter of credulity or immaturity or lack of intelligence. Are there unintelligent people of faith? Sure, they're thick on the ground. But to say that faith as such is unintelligent, I think is simply belied by the existence of all the people I've just named. That should clue the new atheists into the fact that it simply can't be the case that faith is identical to lack of intelligence. Now, let me get at it more substantively. Hitchens and Bill Maher and company are always calling us to know, and the model of knowledge is science. Modern analytical science. Science is a good thing? Sure, sure. It illumines lots of aspects of reality. But what is science like? Science is like a bright light that shines on objects. It's an analytical form of reason where the scientist asks the questions, puts the object of his examination on the table under bright lights, takes it apart. Important? Yes. Am I bad-mouthing it? No, in no way. But that kind of method will give you only a very certain type of knowledge. God. Who or what is God? Well, the one thing God is not is a being in the world. The creator of the universe is not an object within the universe. Therefore, God is not an object which could even in principle be known through analytical scientific analysis. Time and again on my website, people say, give me the evidence for God, as though physical traces of God could be found, as though experiments could be performed 
that would reveal to us God's existence, as though he might display himself like, like Bigfoot. Some say there's a Bigfoot, some say there isn't. Well, let's find out. Well, see, the point is, that's exactly what God is not. Are there rational ways to approach God? Absolutely. But they're not scientific. They can't be. Because God does not correspond to that style of analysis. In fact, what's the right approach to God? The approach of faith. Doesn't mean credulity. Doesn't mean irrationality. In fact, faith is the appropriately rational way of approaching God. hope that makes sense. Now, let me say it again, because I'm echoing John Henry Newman here. Newman said that faith is the reasoning of a religious mind. It's a very interesting definition, isn't it? A religious mind is one that's preoccupied with God. The way a religious mind reasons is by faith. Because God can never be placed under the bright light of analytical reason. It's much more of a questing or searching reason. It's why, as Isaiah says, O God of Israel, thou art a hidden God. See, God never displays himself to analytical vision. That's why in the Bible you can't see God and live. Do you see why? It's not because God's being punitive. It means that in this life you can't see God as an object. Therefore, the proper response to God is faith, the reasoning of a religious mind. Okay. Now, with that general background, I want to look at at Hebrews 11, which is our passage for today. It talks about how the great figures in Israelite history related to God and how that relationship had to be one of faith and not control. It's the same principle. God can't be controlled, analyzed, seen, pinned down on the table. Listen now. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was to go. Okay, two things here, everybody. First of all, Abraham is dealing not with some rival tribal chieftain, not with a family member, not with uh, some elder. He's dealing with God which means he's automatically in the stance of faith. But now, second point. God is not a force or a principle. God is a person, which means God is a subject of freedom. God acts how he wants to act. Therefore, Abraham's relationship to God has to be one of Faith, which means here, trust. Trust. Not irrationality. Not superstition, credulity. Not that. But the only proper response to the God who is a free person is trust. Abraham went out not knowing where he was to go. You know that wonderful prayer by Thomas Merton that begins... My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. Well, see, (laughs) that's true of every one of us, every moment, isn't it? We can have our guesses about how our life is going to go, but we don't know. But see, Merton's prayer is putting himself in the attitude of faith, of trust. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. But then as the prayer unfolds, what becomes clear is that Merton, like Abraham, is putting his faith in God. Listen now. By faith, he, Abraham again, received power to generate, even though he was past the normal age, and Sarah herself was sterile. 
for he thought the one who had made the promise was trustworthy. Now, there's a description of faith. Here's Abraham. The Bible says he was 99, and Sarah was the same, the same as he was 90, I think. Uh, and he hears this promise that, that Sarah will give birth to a child. Reasonable? Well, not in our ordinary experience. But Abraham knew the one who made the promise was trustworthy. And so he had faith. Was he acting stupidly or irrationally? No, it was the reasoning, the right reasoning of a religious mind. And so we hear wonderfully. And so it was. There came forth from one man, himself as good as dead, descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashore. Now, here's another dimension of faith I want you to see. It's the right reasoning of a religious mind. It's an act of trust in God's providence. And it gives rise to life. There's a kind of, if you want wagering or gambling quality, I don't mean that now in a trivial way. What I mean is if you take the plunge, you trust in God, what you'll find is life in abundance, life you never dreamed possible. Listen now as he goes on. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was ready to offer his only son, now see how dramatic this is getting. It's not simply a matter of believing in God. So that's a, a first step. I have faith that God exists. It's not just, okay, I'll, I'll trust in God. Now it's when God makes an impossible demand. Because God had said, through this son, Isaac, you will become the father of many nations. And I want you to sacrifice Isaac. That's why Soren Kierkegaard, the great philosopher, said that faith is a passion for the impossible. See what he means there? It's a hoping against hope. It's a trusting when there seems no ground for trust. This is the radical act now of turning your whole life over to God. Is that irrational? No, no. No, no. Is it superstitious? No. But it is an act of surrender to a mystery that we can't even in principle control. See, that's why faith in the biblical vision brings us to life. Just a quick word about the gospel. Jesus says now to his disciples, Don't be afraid any longer, little flock. For your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. He's asking them to trust. And then he says, listen, sell your belongings and give alms. Provide money bags for yourself that do not wear out. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven awaits you. You see, again, he's asking them to surrender to the providential mercy and direction of God. He's asking them to have faith. Oh, be stupid. <laughs> Accept Bronze Age myths. No, 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 no. Relate properly to the God who cannot in principle be controlled, but who is inviting us to surrender. That, everybody, is faith. And God bless you.